Hello everybody, welcome to today's webinar. Let's get started. It's the top of the hour and today's webinar is Go Global with Search Engine Optimization. Thank you very much indeed for joining us and welcome to you all. So I'm pleased that there are so many attendees today and we have attendees from across Europe and across the United States. So there are some people getting up uh, very early and other people, um, it's the end of the day. Whatever the time of day it is with you, you are welcome and we will do our level best to ensure that you get great value from your time with us today. I take this opportunity to introduce myself. My name is John Worthington. I am the CEO here at IBT and I really do love and so I support and insist upon getting involved in our Go Global webinar series. Um, it's such a way to share information and learn. Uh, personally, I commit to attending two or three webinars each month uh, from some selected thought and practice leaders in our industry. Uh, there's so much innovation out there and it's crucial to keep up to speed uh, and nowhere more so than with search engine optimization which is the subject of today's webinar. So we have a great SEO program prepared for you. I know as I've seen the background work going on um, by Susanna and Teresa um, and as you will see they all got a little carried away but in anticipation of Halloween. Um, so do not be surprised with the scary search engine optimization slide deck that you will soon see. Um, you'll soon understand how witches, goblins, spiders, Ghosts and pumpkins are all totally relevant to global search engine optimization. So before I let them loose on you, just a few moments of housekeeping. Do know that this webinar is one in a series. It's our series of Go Global webinars and you'll be not surprised to know that our objective is to help you go and grow your business globally online. So it's all about webinars and so do check out the resources section of our website, um, webinars up and coming, webinars backslash um, webinars on demand and you'll see the future ones there. We've been doing this for some two years now um, so there is an excellent catalogue you can look back and, and enjoy the past webinars um, at your demand. Um, this webinar will be approximately 45 minutes long, introduced by myself. Then I will hand over to Susanna Hardy, our host presenter today, who will introduce the online program and then today's expert speaker, Teresa Santava. So there you go, on your screen you can see Susanna, the bottom left hand, uh, Teresa in the middle and myself on the right. Uh, we have four polls today, so please um, be ready with your mice and get ready to click and participate in our polls. Your views and opinions are important to us. Um, there is a question box, you see that question box on your screen, questions plus. Um, don't hesitate to click the plus button, submit your questions, we will respond. Um, and if we cannot respond for some reason uh, today because of time limits, we'll respond uh, in the very near future. There's also a chat box, don't hesitate to use it. Um, at the end of the webinar, there is a short five question survey, so please take a moment to give us some feedback. And finally, do know that we are pleased to be able to send you the slide deck and recording of this webinar, which will arrive with you on Friday. So just sit back, enjoy, and um, we're going to be off to the webinar. Now, our host producer, presenter today is Susanna. Susanna is the founding partner, a founding partner of IBT since we got started. Um, Susanna is director for all our client services. So those are the online global website building and marketing programs that we deliver for our clients. Susanna is educated and has lived and worked in both the US, that is over in New York, and Europe, that is in Germany, Belgium, the UK, and France. So perhaps not unsurprisingly, Susanna speaks German, French, English, and Dutch. Um, Susanna puts her languages and her web marketing expertise together, a great use for our clients, and has been doing so over a good number of years. And now to our SEO expert, Teresa. Teresa is definitely a digital native. It's that young online generation that seems to intuitively be totally web-centric. Um, Teresa has many online skills and her accolades include a first-class business degree from Warwick and a master's with distinction from City University London. Teresa is a web marketing and HubSpot guru and I have to say I bow to all of her knowledge and understanding of all things search engine. Teresa herself is also very global. Teresa is Czech in origin and has traveled the world and speaks Czech, English, Slovak, French and German. 
Teresa heads our SEO programs here at IBT, and by the end of this webinar, you will understand why. Uh, when preparing for this uh, presentation, Ter Teresa spent her time paring down her immense knowledge to just give us 20 minutes of nuggets. Um, uh, she has such an encyclopedic knowledge of SEO. Um, uh, two words on IBT. Um, IBT, we are a private company. We're a private company of online engineers and business developers, kind of profiles like Susanna and Teresa around the globe. We have been in business for over 15 years, helping companies go global online. Our core activity is helping companies grow their businesses internationally, and we do that through online global programs. So our core message is go global with website localization, of which SEO is absolutely key and fundamental. And in today's digital world, a company's number one asset for marketing and sales at home and internationally is online. So with that as the intro, what I do now is pass over to Susanna. And Susanna, are you there? Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, John. That was great. And um, I, it's a real pleasure to be here with everybody today to talk about global SEO and what that means. Um, so we've, as John said, we've, we've tried to cut it down to sort of some basics and some really core messages and not get lost in the details. So we're really going to talk much about the, the search engines, the country language specifics, and then the keywords and what are called web crawlers. Um, as John said, please do drop questions in during, uh, while, while, while we're having the chat, and uh, we will get back to you. So we would really encourage you to, to drop questions into the question box as we get along. So I just wanted to set the scene first uh, from our point of view, and that really is a digital point of view but also an international trade point of view. Um, and there's a lot of talk about, about nationalism, about the end of globalization and so on. So I was really intrigued. I mean, it's not something we've seen. So I'm really intrigued by this McKinsey report that came out in February of this year, which was just talking about the levels of cross-border bandwidths and cross-border digital trade that has been going on since 2005, which they've measured cross-border bandwidth as a, as, a, as a representation of it, times 45 in those 10 years, and projected to grow another 9% between up to 2020. Uh, all this means basically that now, as, as McKinsey point out, the flows of digital, which enables the movement of goods, services, finance, and people, all of that now exerts a bigger impact on GDP growth than the actual physical influence of a trade of goods. Um, so that's, I think, that's really underlying the point about the need to have a strong online presence in today's business world. And, and by the way, I'm intrigued as well always to point out that the biggest flows are along that U.S.-Europe border, uh, um, sorry, um, um, a barrier, and that's uh, that yellow streak in the picture there. Um, now, for most companies today, your website is the single most important sales tool that the salesmen have. And a good website should, should do many things. Uh, it should help you find leads. It should help um, get those leads to trust you and reinforce that trust and reinforce the brand awareness that you need for a successful buyer's journey. Now, most of you know this and hopefully use this for your core domestic website. But what we find very often is that the export websites that you have um, uh, are slightly neglected for this. And in fact, we feel and would argue that the export websites need even greater uh, work and, and, and are, are even more important in terms of a sales tool for your international sales force. Um, so uh, we would think that, you know, about today, your export websites to really work hard for you and generate fabulous leads build the trust and brand awareness that you need for long-term sales growth in your export markets. And the key to that growth, really, and the key to that brand awareness and, 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 um, and, and, and lead-ups in your export markets is really empathy for your audience. And once you grasp what your target market is looking for, you can more effectively reach and keep the users and, and, uh, and viewers of your website. Now, you know this for your whole website, and we are here to help you uh, um, achieve that really for your export websites to really really boost your sales. 
So, and, and uh, how do we do that? Basically, well, I would leave it in the hands and the good words of Mr. Woody Allen. As he said famously, sort of 80% of success is just showing up. And that's how we feel about localized websites. Um, and I want to talk about what do we mean by export websites? What do we mean by localized websites? So how do we get your websites just to show up and just to be there? Well, we localize them. Here's what we mean. We, we've brought this down, down to about a checklist of 10 key items, 10 key, key things that we think are really uh, uh, needed for that checklist. And the first really is sort of a country-specific design and content and, of course, a mobile-enabled um, website. So I've put two pictures here of a road. What, do you, what does a road conjure up to someone who lives in Scotland? What does a road conjure up to someone who lives in, the, in, in, uh, uh, in California? You know, these are different things. So, um, you know, this, there is uh, localization is also about tweaking and making sure that you are embedded in the local culture. It's obviously also technical in terms of having multilingual navigation and geolocation so that you're identifying where your customers are coming from. Then it's having very good content management systems. These are the scaffoldings that you build, um, that you build uh, websites on. And hosting. Hosting is important for the speed of both up and downloads for a local website. And that's very important given today's attention spans of about two seconds. Next on our, web, on our localization checklist, I would also put that we have regulatory requirements. It is increasingly important to have absolute uh, compliance with your local regulatory authorities on the web. And this goes from you know, authorship, which basically talks about ownership and traceability and data protection. And these vary according to different markets. And you must be compliant throughout that we uh, see more and more over the coming years. After that, we really insist also on domains. And Therese has got something to talk about that on SEO as well. There's a picture here on the right of these different types of domains, you know, from ES to um, Spain to .de for Germany. These are really important that you own these domains and don't give them like to a distributor or anyone else. These are important for your brand, important for your long-term development. And finally, in terms of social media across local platforms in local languages, it's no good building a, a, a fantastic website and then parking it in an obscure garage. You really need to get the website out there moving amongst the local traffic. You need to get the website out to be seen and to be a vibrant, vivacious part of your, of your export team. And that means a lot of social media and finding the right local platforms and the right local languages to communicate in for your product, for your, your, uh, your service, and in your local market. Susanna. So moving on. Well, Susanna, could I jump yes. in there and do a quick poll? What do you think? It's time for the first poll. So I'm going to launch a poll. Excellent Please, idea. everybody, are you ready? Sorry about that, Susanna, but here we go. I'm going to launch. Please, um, this is the poll. This is poll number one. Do you have localized websites for your export markets? Here we go. Here's the question. Yes, all our main export markets. Yes, but only a few export markets. No thinking about it. So what is the feedback? Um, 17, 15% are saying yes, all of our main, 10% yes, only a few, 36% are no, um, 20, it's, these numbers are moving, 30% um, are thinking about it. So I'm going to close the poll there, but you will have the results in the information that you'll receive on Friday. So that's it, that's poll number one, closed. Susanna, back to you. Great. Final number there. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, I just, before I hand over to Teresa, I also wanted just to say, just, you know, just to refresh our memories, what are search engines? What do they do? In brief, they structure the internet. They have two major functions. They can build, they build indexes and therefore provide search users with a ranked list of the websites that they're determined are uh, most relevant. In this sense, you can compare a search engine almost like an answering machine. When someone goes online to search for something, the search engine looks through all its billions of documents and information. That information is through uh, all kinds of different formats. Um, um, it can be pictures and, and JPEGs as well, videos. And the search engine does two things. 
First, it returns those results that are most relevant or useful to the searcher's query. Second, it ranks those results according to the popularity of the websites. So what I wanted to show here is how does your, your search engine look at your website? Your search engine doesn't always see a lot of like the colors and some of the designs. What it sees is the words, the pictures of it, the, the patterns of it, the relevance of it in terms of the words, uh, uh, and, and, and how they match the searches. So one has to be very aware also about how a search engine sees that. What I would say then, if your search engine is all about building an index and then ranking those index, you want to be influencing the relevance and the popularity of your website. And search engine optimization, the way I figure it, is really about influencing the relevance of your website and the popularity of your website. And with that, I'd really like to turn over to Teresa to talk about, um, about, uh, about the search engines. Teresa? Uh, yes, thank you, Susanna, and thank you, John, for inviting me to take part in today's webinar. I'm happy to be here, and hello to all of our attendees. So I would like to start with a review of international search engines and which search engines really lead various markets across the world. And therefore we have to start with Google because Google is the global leader but it also dominates uh, the search market across numerous countries with over 90% share in most European countries, South America, Australia, but also in many Asian countries like Turkey, United Arab Emirates, or Saudi Arabia. So they are very dominant and it's very likely that if you want to optimize for your export markets, you will be optimizing for Google. So it's good because there's a certain level of familiarity. Now, then it comes as a bit of surprise that uh, Google doesn't have such a dominant position in its home market with 72% share. Yes, it's still leading, it's still very important, but it's slightly lagging behind its dominance in some of the overseas markets. Now, those are really the countries where Google is the number one, but there are a few exceptions there are a few countries where Google is not the number one. One of those countries is Russia, where a search engine called Yandex has 58%. And it has actually penetrated to some other countries as well. Yandex is also used in uh, Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan, or even in Turkey. And it's not noteworthy that Google is actually the second search engine in Russia. So even though it's not the number one, uh, you still have a good chance if you're optimizing for Google that uh, you will pop up in search results in Russia. Now, the situation is quite different in China, where Google just is not present. It has been banned from China, and even before the ban, Google wasn't performing really well. Some say it's partially because the, the, the search behavior of Chinese people is, is different and the local companies, the local search engines manage to react better to and to respond to the local needs. And uh, the leader in China is certainly Baidu with 55%. However, its position has weakened over the years. A few years back, their share was 80%. But today there are some other local search engines that are trying to get part of the share. And, and why? Because China is enormous, it has big potential, and the Chinese online search market is huge, so they want to get part of it as well. And if you'd like to learn more about the search engines in China, if you'd like to know how the ranking algorithm differs between Baidu and Google, then check out the blog, you've got the link there, and you can learn a bit more about that. And then another example is South Korea, where uh, search engine Neighbor has 77%. 
Um, this search engine has been launched by ex-Samsung employees and today has also presence in Japan. And that's the last example from our list. However, it's important to say Google is number one in Japan. It just isn't as strong as in all those other markets. And it's Yahoo Japan with 40% share that's trying to step on its feet. And of course, uh, neighbor. So these are the exceptions. And of course, there are some other global search engines like uh, Yahoo and Bing. We haven't forgotten about them. But these four are really those that managed to get a dominant position within a certain country. So that would be a quick overview of the various search engines across the world. Teresa, can I jump in and yeah. propose my second poll? Of course. Okay, well here we go, please. Are you ready? Please uh, get to your mice, uh, hands on the mice, and here I'm launching it. This is a poll about search engines. There you go, not unsurprisingly. Which search engines are important for your global market, markets? Please, you can click on all of these, so don't hesitate. It's just not one or two. Is it Google and or Baidu and or Yandex? Um, how about some of those other ones that Teresa mentioned, Nava, Yahoo, and Bing? Um, so we've got 90% at Google, 7% are saying China. There you go, Baidu, and 50% are other. Well, there you go. That's very interesting. Thank you very much indeed for sharing. Um, we're going to go, yes, that's poll number two done. Um, Teresa, back to you. Great. So that's a very strong preference for Google. And then you mentioned also Baidu was one of the interests, right? Great. So I will try to reflect that in, in this presentation. Um, so yeah, we will we will start with Google. Not only that it's the number one, but as you have voted, it's also the most important one to you. But to be clear, it's not just one Google. Uh, there are local versions of Google across the world, and uh, they all use the same ranking algorithm. However, the search results are different, and they differ because uh, of different languages spoken in different countries. For example, Google.de, which is the German Google, will have the search results in German, and they will be very different to those uh, in the U.S. But even between countries that speak the same language, the results can be very different. For example, the U.S. versus the U.K. And it's not just because of slightly different terminology. It's mostly because Google really cares about which country you are targeting. And if you are a U.S. company exporting to the U.K. or the other way around, and if you'd like to know more about like how much should you localize, then check out the blog. It has some good tips, and it can also help you with uh, the search engine optimization for the very similar market but still different. Now, another example I would like to uh, give you is uh, from Switzerland. They have actually four official languages, and you can actually choose which language you prefer for your search results on the Swiss Google. So even within the country, there are many variations. Still, it's the same ranking algorithm, but the search results are different. And there's one more example that I would like to mention, and that's within the same country that speaks just one language, the search results can be different and the ranking algorithm can be different. In one case, it depends on the device. The desktop search and the mobile search results are different because Google has adjusted their ranking algorithm. And the Today, it's, it's not the topic of discussion. We will not be going into the detail what are the differences between mobile and desktop search algorithms, but I think it's really worth mentioning just because mobile search is so popular in many of those export markets, so you might want to make sure your site is mobile responsive and optimized for search engines, and you should uh, just check to make sure that it fulfills Google's requirements. So with that, I would like to discuss a bit more what is actually important to Google. 
So I already said the language, the country you're targeting, and the, the language it's all very clear. Um, but you might be wondering, how do I actually tell Google which country I'm targeting? Do I just put a local address on the contact page? Um, what's important is to include a country code in the domain that you have. And you can do that in three different ways. Firstly, you can uh, have the country code in the top level domain, for example, www.company.fr where FR is the country code that stands for France. So Google knows that this domain you're targeting France. Or you can create a subdirectory, which is www.company.com slash FR. And that slash FR, that part is present in all of your URLs and it's another way of letting Google know you're targeting France. And the third way is a use of subdomains where the www at the beginning is actually replaced with the country code. So that would be fr.company.com. And these three ways are all equally effective when it comes to international search engine optimization. And there's actually one more thing you can do to let Google know which country you're targeting, and it's by implementing an hreflang attribute. This is a piece of HTML code that tells Google which country you want to target. And if you just Google it, you will find instructions and guidelines on, on how to embed it. Um, some content management systems will not allow you to, to add it, but others will. So, But it's a very important piece that helps you target it. And those would be really the country-specific tips for search engine optimization. But when it comes to your export markets, there are some rules that also apply to your home market. Just, you know, whatever site you want to optimize. And those are, Google really likes content that is of high quality, that is unique, that is descriptive. Um, what really helps is when you get some fresh content out there, and blogs are a great way of doing that. So you always have something up to date and you can keep on expanding the content. Google really likes that. And you will find that just by adding a blog to your website, you will increase the possible target audience immensely. You will find all of these tips and guidelines in Google Webmaster Guidelines. And they are the same for all markets. You just have to adjust them for your specific country. And today we will not go through all the rules, but if you go check out those guidelines, you will find uh, tips on how to let Google know that you're there, how to find you. Um, you will read that they really hate um, websites that try to trick Google or to deceive the website visitors for example, by using um, irrelevant keywords or by creating sneaky redirects or even participation in the link schemes. So avoid those things. And all of that is in those guidelines. So have a look at those. And a big part of search engine optimization for export markets is the use of right keywords. That's very important, and that's why we actually dedicated a whole section to it. And before we dive into it, John, could I ask you to run our next poll, please? Sure, absolutely. Ready to go. Um, and no trick or treating this poll, please. Here we go. Are you ready? I'm launching it now. Do you update your home website with new content, blogs, and articles? There you go. So how active are you all? Um, please, it's yes, once a month, um, once a quarter, uh, but less than once a year, or we don't have a blog and news section. So no rest for the wicked. Uh, this Halloween, 60% are saying yes, once a month. That's very impressive. Well done, everybody. 30%, um, there's 25% are saying no. We don't have a blog news section on our website. Again, this information will be shared with you. I think it's time to close this poll. I'm thanking you, and Teresa, back to you. 
Thank you, Jan. That's, um, that's quite interesting. So those who already are active, well done. Keep it going and do it for each of your markets. That's, that's my tip. For those of you who don't have a blog or a news section, I would certainly recommend to do that for your home market, for your export markets. It will really open up whole, a lot of new opportunities for you. So now let's dive into the keywords. We all know what keywords are, but just to recap, those are the words or the phrases that you type in to the search engine in order to find information, in order to find and buy a product, or to find a solution to your problem. But a lot of companies, they think about keywords only as keywords for products, how to call the product. Um, and it's a pity because the keywords should be used in a broader context because a lot of people actually just look for a solution. You're not looking for a specific product. And I would like to demonstrate on how you can grow your list of keywords on an example. So if you imagine that you're in the garden industry, you're actually uh, in the garden supplies and you have a product uh, which is an aphid spray. It's a spray that you put on plants that are being eaten by those creepy bugs and destroying all of your crops. So if you're selling aphid spray, you might start thinking, okay, what product name should I use? Aphid spray, spray for aphid, or pesticide for aphids, or insecticide. And probably a lot of people search up for that. But at the same time, there will be a lot of competition. So it will be difficult really to stand out. So you should start thinking about what's unique about your AFIP spray. It might be that it's um, only using biological ingredients. So you can use a term organic AFIP spray or a natural AFIP pesticide. And those are going into the right direction. You're being more specific. There are probably fewer people searching for it, but at the same time, those people really want what you're selling, what you have to offer. So it's going in the right direction. And if you want, you can even take it one step farther. For example, organic aphid spray for pumpkins, if that's what you're selling. And what is nice about these really long tail keywords is that it's actually not just one keyword. Organic aphid spray for pumpkins actually has an aphid spray, it has organic aphid spray, and it has a spray for pumpkins. And you're actually optimizing for all of those keywords within a single long tail keyword. So that's a good keyword that you could be using. And you should think in that direction when uh, doing the same for your home market or for your export market. But that's just the beginning. That's just the product name. As I said, you should be thinking broader. People are looking for information. They are Googling aphid infestation or aphids on pumpkins or even how to get rid of aphids. And if you write a blog on that topic and you optimize it with those keywords, you're immensely broadening your reach. And, and if you want, if you have the resources, take it even step far, farther. Some people, they don't know what problem they're having. They might be Googling green insect on pumpkins or pumpkin diseases. It's very likely they will want your product to just have no clue. So help them find you. Don't rely on them knowing exactly what they want. And so that's the strategy how you should be thinking about your keywords. And I know it sounds like a lot of work because, because it is. It, it requires a lot of research and it requires a lot of brainstorming. Teresa, I just want to interject here. Susanna, that was a great example. I love pumpkins. I grow them all the time, especially for Halloween. And I want to interject here because this is some of the such an important part of localizing and getting your export websites right. If your keywords are working in your home market and you're doing good work on making sure that your keywords are, are, are right on spot, in that sweet spot of long-tailed, vital uh, keywords, 
you can't necessarily assume that they will be exactly the same in all of your export markets. You can't assume that they will translate directly either. So the export market keyword search is a really key, sorry for the pun, function and part of localizing your websites for your export markets. If you've got it right in your home market for your keywords, then that's already a huge step forward. But don't assume that you know exactly what the keywords will be in your export markets. We have a lot of clients who spend, and we spend a lot of time with clients making sure that they've got the right keywords for all their markets. And you'd be amazed at how many differences there are. Even in markets like uh, you know, the US versus the UK, huge differences in even simple products for the right keywords. But thanks, Teray, though. I, wanted to get, I just wanted to stress that and help you with that. Thanks. Thank you, Suzanne. I think it's, it's exactly the point. You cannot just translate them. It, it's a great starting point, but you have to do that research specifically for, for each of your markets. Yeah. And I actually, the, the next thing I would like to discuss is um, where the keywords show in search results. And all of you are very familiar with the structure. Uh, so I'll just do a quick recap. That's where you have the search term, the keyword, and the search bar is what you're looking for. Uh, sometimes you will get image search results if they're relevant. You will also see some paid search results. People pay to get those displayed and clicked on. And then you have your organic text search results. That's what we're focusing on today. Those are the results. And each of those results has at least three components, three elements. That's the page title, URL, and then we have a meta description. So page title, URL, and meta description. These are the three elements. That's where your keywords show up. But let's follow the Spider-Man. Let's see where the spiders actually look. Because uh, those are not the only places where the keywords should be. The web spiders, also called web crawlers or web robots, they look at your site and then they feed this information to the ranking algorithm and there are some facts more important than others. What is relevant and what helps boost your ranking position is the presence of keywords in the page title, which is what we saw as the first element in the text search results is the use of headings, uh, use of bold text, keywords should be also present in your URLs, and um, in hyperlinks, so if you have any internal links, for example, within your site, it's good to include the keywords there, and within the body text. There is no golden rule how many times the keyword should be in, in, on a page. It depends, of course, on how long, how many words you've got there. It, it has to feel natural, it has to sound natural. Uh, Google hates keyword spamming, it can penalize you if you overuse keywords, and at the same time it will look weird to your visitors. So make sure that what you're doing, you're writing content for people, not for search engines. Have those guidelines in your mind, but write for the people. And there's a lot of other locations where you should put the keywords, for example, the image out attribute text field, um, and those are useful and those apply across the different languages. You just have to make sure that the keywords are specific for each of your markets. And now the final thing I would like to discuss today is some of the SEO myths. There are some things that people are not sure, are they good, are they bad, or are they just unimportant? And Sometimes it depends on the search engine that you are targeting. For example, meta descriptions. This is the third element that is displayed in the search results as a little sentence. And for example, Google doesn't take meta description into account in their ranking algorithm. 
but it's still important because that's your sales pitch. If you get the meta description right, that's how you actually convince people to click through because remember, it's not only about popping up in the search results, you also need to convince um, the, the website visitor to click through and visit your site. That's, of course, part of it. So even though it doesn't directly contribute to improve your ranking position, it's still a very important element. But on some other search engines, like Baidu, this is actually part of the ranking algorithm. So pay attention to your meta description. Whichever market or search engine you're targeting, somewhere it's more relevant than other, but still it's really good to have that one optimized. Something else are the meta keywords. This is a slightly outdated con concept, especially for Google. So some people, they use meta keywords, they just put a bunch of keywords into the HTML code, and these are not visible to the website visitors, they're just in the code, and Google actually ignores them. Uh, we still see a lot of people using, like, can you, put, can you use these meta keywords? And actually, it doesn't really have impact on anything, and you should be just spending time doing something else, something more effective, because Google ignores it. However, some other search engines, like Baidu, they still might be looking at those meta keywords. So depending on the search engine, if it's Google, you, you're good to ignore. If it's something else, it's a different search engine, just uh, review it, and it's better to, to get it optimized for those. So those are the meta elements, and uh, next, let's have a look at Flash and JavaScript. These two are really difficult to crawl and index, and search engines like Baidu, they, they struggle with those. Google has made some improvements. They're trying to be able to crawl and index more content within Flash and JavaScript, but it's still not 100%. With Flash, a lot of high-tech companies like Google and Apple, they're, they're trying to step away from it because while it was handy, at the early age of the internet, now it's kind of redundant and people say it's bad for SEO, it's actually not user friendly, so if you can, avoid Flash. JavaScript can be actually useful when it comes to building websites, just make sure you don't put any crucial, any important content, and if you do, then put it somewhere else uh, on the website in other form as well. So, there is a good chance Google will be able to crawl it, but don't rely on that. And for other search engines, it's better to assume they cannot crawl and index it. And the last two are inbound and outbound links. So inbound links are those going from other websites to your own company website. And people ask, are they good, are they bad? They can be either. If you have a very good online reputation side linking to you, that can help you. That's what the original ranking algorithm of Google was based on, the number of links pointing to the site. But because it was misused, they abandoned that. It's not just the quantity, it's about the quality. So if you have a few good websites linking to you, that's great, that will help you. If you have poor websites linking to you, it won't help you. And if you have bad reputation of websites linking to you, it will harm you. It will harm you a lot. You will get penalized and you might just get completely lost. You will not be visible. So 100% avoid any participation in uh, buying links. And then Outbound links are quite interesting because it's the other way around. It's you linking to other websites. And while Google likes showing relevance, so in a way, if you link to a website that is relevant, that has good reputation, it can a tiny bit help you, but it's more about the users. You know, if you feel they will be interested in that link, do it, add it. But don't over-optimize your website with links to other websites, hoping it will boost your ranking, because it won't. Inbound links are much more important for this than outbound links. Outbound links are just nice when they are relevant within, within the context. 
So that that's everything from me. Those are some of the SEO myths. And if you have any more questions, then don't hesitate. Uh, let us know, and we will be well, happy to answer. Teresa, before we do that, can I just jump in? This is our last and final um, uh, poll here, so I'm going to launch it directly relevant to, to what Teresa has just been uh, talking on. Here we go. Um, do you identify and use keywords for your global export market? So are you on it as, as outlined by uh, Teresa? Um, yes for products and blogs and social media. Yes, but only for products. Thinking about it still scared of those scary, scary spiders and crawlers. So we have, actually it's fairly flat, we have about 30% yes for products and blogs, 30% only for products, and 30% are thinking about it. So it's pretty flat there. Um, actually, it's a bit of a majority now thinking about it. So thank you very much. I'm going to close. That was our last poll. And there we go. That was that. And now I'm going to hand back. Thank you, John. I'm going to take back from Teresa and Susanna here again. Just really concluding, uh, we're, we're running a little bit late on time, so I'm going to sort of cut back a bit here and try and save some time for questions. Just really wanted to summarize for us a website localization. Really, how I see it is basically, as, and, and I think clear from what Teresa was saying, if the search engines are all localized for their individual markets, whether that's through the the, the, the language, the content, the relevancies, what people are searching for, everything within the search engines themselves are localized for every single market. Um, then it stands to reason that if your export website is targeting a specific market, it needs to follow that guideline. It needs to really be coordinated with the local website, uh, with the local search engine. Um, and how to do that really is the optimization well, it's all about, as I said earlier, I think, influencing the relevance and the popularity of your website on a local level. And I hope that uh, Teresa's given some flavor of just how, how specific that can be and the differences between Baidu and Google, um, amongst others, and the differences in all the markets. Now, I won't uh, I'll cut a bit short here. To hopefully, we've had a few questions in, John. Yep, there certainly are, and I'm aware of the time. I thank you very much indeed for submitting the questions. Let's jump straight to it, uh, to Teresa. Here we go. We are a U.S. company, um, and I was wondering if internal links within our website helps our SEO. There you go, Teresa. Quick answer. Um, thanks, John. With the internal links, it would be similar to the outbound links. They are nice. If you have something relevant to link to, it's nice to show that your website is interconnected. But don't think that, again, over-optimizing your site with internal links will somehow boost your performance. So use it wisely where it's relevant and where it adds value. Great, Teresa. Thank you. And actually sticking with links, um, let's field this one to Susanna. Inbound and outbound links this time. How do we choose them for our export markets, Susanna? Um, very good question. This is something we spend quite a bit of time on for our, with our clients. Um, and, and typically, the first place to look is where you, what you're doing in your core domestic market. For example, if you're linked to your industry trade association, then we'll try and see, and if that, that would be seen as a good quality link, then we'll see if we can find a similar trade association in your, your target markets. Um, and without just linking it, we'll try and make it a bit dynamic and have some kind of uh, interaction between those associations. One of the easiest and quickest also is obviously to link to major distributors that you're using. But the choice of inbound and outbound links are very, very market specific and has to be guided by quality, I think, as Teresa was saying. Thanks, John. Yeah, Susanna, thank you. So, Teresa, moving on. Um, this one is, our company is launching a new product next year, so that's 2017. Um, I want to know if paid search can improve my website's ranking position. Uh, Teresa.
that, that's fascinating. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to field the last question, which is about videos. The, uh, uh, the question here is, is about videos and how, does vi how do videos influence my ranking on Google? Um, uh, I'm going to take that question because we do a lot of videos. We really like the video side, so we're very happy on that. And basically, what we would say is that videos are good, good, uh, good news. And generally speaking, we do try and and encourage that. One of the reasons is that it's a really easy way on export markets. It's very acceptable to keep the English language and just have keywords in the translated uh, subtitles. So that's an, an easy an easy fix, as it were. And the other point about videos is it does actually help your SEO in terms of the popularity or the ability to find it because the videos um, uh, can often show up, I think, as, as that Spider-Man um, example showed earlier, although not for all markets. Remember, of course, that YouTube is banned in China, for example. So, um, John, I don't know if we have any time for other questions. Yep, um, I think we're going to have to move straight on now. So what I'd like to say is thank you very much indeed. But before we close, we have just a little SEO factoid for you, which we thought would be of interest. Do know that 93% of online experiences begin with a search engine. So there you go. It's all about search <laughs> engines and therefore search engine optimization. As another number, 75% of SEO is off-page and 25% is on-page. And finally, 70% of the links search users click on are organic. So there you go. It's all about web. It's all about SEO. It's all about those search engines. So I'd like to thank you for joining us today. I'd like to remind you that this is one in a series. Um, our new subjects coming up include online country-specific websites and marketing, how to sell online in the USA, e-commerce in China, and how to sell online in Europe. So do join us again. When we close this down now, there will be a quick question survey on your screen. So please do respond. Give us some feedback. It'd be great to hear from you. And do know that you'll get the recording on Friday. So finally, we hope you enjoyed the webinar. Thank you for joining us. And we hope that you have a really scary SEO Halloween. Thank you again. Thank you, John. Thank you, Teresa. And happy exporting, everybody.